when talking about what, what is the new Wall Street going to look like, I really honestly felt that one of the cornerstones of what new Wall Street will be will be about investing in the environment or about clean tech, sustainability, efficiency revolution, whatever you want to call it. But I think today what maybe we'll do is we'll talk a little bit more about food, energy, and water. Um, and when you look at what would Wall Street look like if it was here in San Francisco, these would certainly be three major themes of, of what we're looking at. So the idea is that if you think about food, energy, and water, think about Jeremy Grantham who said, it's not just peak oil, it's peak everything. Well, whether, whether or not you believe that, the fact is that the demand for food, energy, and water right now globally is outstripping supply. So what is the driver behind why this is happening? Well, it has a lot to do with population. As some of you may know, in, what was it, October, we surpassed 7 billion people on this planet. Let's look at, at what's happened here. It took us 1,800 years to actually get to a billion people from, you know, obviously, I've, you know, there was time before that, but let's just use this <laughs> you know, here. So, you know, 1,800 years to get to, a, get to a billion people, and then it took 160 years to get to 3 billion people. Presently, we're, we're uploading or adding on an additional 13, every 13 years, a billion people. So this population is just starting to rise off the chart. But the fact is you cannot invest around this kind of population growth. I mean, we're talking about 2,000 years here, even though that is, that is a pretty good model that most people on Wall Street would like to see this kind of uh, performance here. But unfortunately, the time frame is too long. So what is it that we're going to have to think about when we think about food, energy, and water? We're going to have to think about Sorry, uh, we're gonna have to think about the rise of the middle class. This is going to be the issue. We're entering the decade of the consumer. So if you look at this, right now we're at 26% or 27% of the population is deemed middle class. This number is slated to double in the next 10 years according to the Brookings Institute and Goldman Sachs. So that brings us into this kind of area in 2020, which causes a huge problem. Because when you think about somebody that goes from being poor, as 70% of the population is, to being middle class, what happens? They want, they want high protein diets, they want energy, electricity, they want vehicles, they want to live the kind of life that we all take for granted. Now the issue becomes, when you think about food, energy, and water, is that their impact across those three themes could triple in a one year. So you think about it, it's not just the population that we have to worry about, it's the fact that more people are using more stuff. That's what we really have to take into account. So let's have a look at that. Let's just look at this. This is the shifting diets with the income growth. You can see here, this is where we are up in here, Australia, Japan, I know it's kind of small, but the main point of this is that you look, this is Sub-Saharan Africa and China down here. Everybody is shifting up and to the right. So as they make more money, they're starting to shift up and to the right. Let's look at this. This is what water looks like. As we talked about, they want high protein diets. For one kilo, to procure one kilo of grain, it requires 660 gallons. Now I know I, it's, it's kilos to gallons. I know I probably should have done the calculation differently, but, um, but when you look at one kilo of beef, it's 4,000 gallons of water. Now this is a huge problem because this is what people are going to want to eat. They're going to want to eat more beef. What does beef require? It requires rangeland. It requires um, arable land to grow stuff to feed these cattle. And think about where the big population expansions are happening. They're happening in India and China. India is 17% of the global population, but only has 4% of the water resources. China is the same, 20% of global population, 7% of water resources. So we've got some huge issues that, that need to be addressed here. Um, Look at this, energy intensity right here. Look at South Korea and Taiwan, China's wealthy neighbors. As soon as their GDP passed 7,000, they skyrocketed up here in terms of the amount of energy that they're using. This same thing is going to happen down here. You know, look at China, with, even with its massive population, only tenth in the, uh, they use one-tenth the amount of oil that the United States does. If they use it the same intensity that we use here, they, they actually would surpass all of us combined in the amount of oil that they're using per year. So these are just kind of things to, to think about. Think about that from a vehicle standpoint. For every thousand people in China, there's only 37 cars. There's 800 of them per thousand people here in the United States. But the most amazing thing is that you have, the population of China is so big that they still sell more cars in China than we sell here. 
which is, which is a huge problem too because you've got 400 million people that are entering the middle class. That is a population of middle class that is larger than the population of this country alone. And think about when, when these people start wanting to have vehicles, think about the amount of steel that requires to manufacture a vehicle. Then think about the amount of energy that it takes to require the steel, then think about how much water it takes to, to create that energy. And again, we arrive at the same problem. Um, so these are the kind of areas that we should be looking at, but when I want to specifically address kind of the new Wall Street, these are all areas that, that are not uncommon at all to, to the area of San Francisco, Sand Hill Road. But the issue that I see is that it's all predominantly, and this is probably a gross overstatement, but it's predominantly focused around the venture community. And now when you look at the world from investing in this area, this is, not, uh, this is not obviously to scale, but it's not an inaccurate depiction of the size of the public investment world versus the size of the venture world. When you think about in investing in venture, it was a phenomenal success out here during the late 90s. But the problem is, is that this boom, this demand that's going to most likely create some sort of clean tech or clean economy type boom, it's not the same as the tech boom. These are not companies that can be developed in somebody's dorm room somewhere, and uh, they're not companies that can be just kind of propagated out over the internet. These are companies that require infrastructure, require manufacturing. They require a lot more things than what we were looking at during the tech boom. And when you think about it, oh, sorry, um, think about the, the investment area here. Venture funds right now, they actually out, uh, the amount of money that's going into venture funds outstrips public funds investing in this area by 38 to 1. Think about that. 38 to 1 is going into the venture community versus this entire universe of companies that's down here. And just to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, these are kind of more emerging names. You obviously will recognize SunPower, Investus, and Tesla you know, right here in the backyard. Um, and then these are more kind of core names. And what I'm trying to get people to understand is that these are the names that are going to be the backbone of this movement into the clean economy. These are the guys that have been in existence for hundreds of years. Trinity Industries, 105 year old metal bending company, they make rail cars, they actually even make coal hoppers. One thing that they decided to do is said, instead of having a metal tube that goes on train tracks, what happens if we turn it this way and stack one on top of each other? We could make the tower components for wind turbines. It's only 12% of revenue for them right now, but think about if wind becomes what we all think it could become. Think about how big that company will become because they will be the number one tower manufacturer for wind turbines in the United States. You know, another example would be a polypore here. These guys are a 75-year-old lead-acid battery company, not a clean company, would not show up in any sort of sustainability modeling. But what's interesting is that 15% of their revenues is to manufacture um, membranes for the lithium ion batteries. This company, based upon just that 15% over the last year, went from $13 to 70, based upon that, in, that, that just that one product that they're manufacturing. Now that, that stock price has come in a little bit based upon electric vehicles, but it's showing you that these companies down here, when we think about investing in it, and if New Wall Street was to exist here and investing in these areas, we really would have to think about investing fully down the supply chain. So what I'm trying to do is just get people to think about it. This is not just a venture world. Even though San Francisco is the venture capital and is also the clean tech capital in the world, we cannot forget what's happening here. It's kind of interesting. When I, when I walk around New York and talk to people about this market space, and, and then I walk around San Francisco, you, you start to understand in New York, they love hedge funds and they love public funds. They don't understand the clean economy. When you come out here, they love the clean economy, they just don't like public funds. So it's kind of a, you know, it becomes kind of an issue out here because you've got one side that's looking at investing in this space, but up here, and then the other side that loves these guys down here, but they don't like the theme at all. So anyway, this was just kind of a, a thought that I had when I was just thinking about what new Wall Street would look like, and, and this is what I believe when we look at, at solving some of these issues and these demands that I went through at the, at the beginning, this is just what I think that this new Wall Street should look like. Thank you.